absolutely agree. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Thanks for joining us um, today. My name is Ruby Golo, the Executive Director for Global Chamber in Accra, Ghana. I welcome you all to our monthly glo Global Inland event, which is in partnership with my two beautiful friends and colleagues in the UK, uh, Katie Kiff, the Executive Director, Global Chamber in London, and Patricia, um, uh, who is the Principal Consultant in International Trade and Investment Specialist at the Synergy System Consult UK Limited. Um, they both will be telling us a bit more about themselves and their passion for today's topic. If you are joining us for the very first time, uh, Global Chamber is the only organization in the world uh, with hundreds of locations that helps executives grow sustainable business through warm connections and virtual services. If you like what we do today and want to become a member, then please do reach out to me or any of my ED colleagues on here today. For um, my opening remarks, I would like to say that Ghana is a place to be, um, despite the challenges, of course, um, there are infrastructure challenges in doing business in Africa, but beyond the difficulties uh, lie an ocean of opportunities that awaits uh, you all. Uh, let's hear from the experts on how we can take advantage of the opportunities that uh, African Free Trade Continental Free Trade Agreement presents. On this note, I hand over back to Patricia, who will be <laughs> our guest moderator uh, to take this away. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Ruby, for that introduction. Uh, it's quite interesting to see a lot of people coming from all over the world. So this is really um, very significant. It means that uh, Ghana is really on the map in terms of the relationship they share with the UK. So that's quite very significant and I must applaud um, uh, everyone to join us today. Um, so once again, you're welcome to the Ghana UK Trade and Investment Forum. I will just put us through uh, what we expected today and the topics of our discussions and, and, and you know, expectations. And uh, like Ruby said, I'll be moderating today's session uh, alongside with my colleagues. So we're just gonna be doing it side by side. Uh, just to talk a bit about myself, I'm gonna talk more about what we do later on, but I'll just progress uh, about myself. Uh, I'm the principal consultant for um, uh, Synergy Systems Consults UK Limited, um, and uh, I have background uh, over 15 years in trade and investment. I worked um, with the Department of International Trade in Africa for over 12 and a half years, where I helped and um, supported a lot of British companies exporting to Africa, specifically within the Sub-Saharan um, 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 countries. Um, it's quite a, a, a lot of passion for, for me in terms of uh, building relationships uh, with, within the UK and Africa. And Ghana is quite on top of my heart in terms of actually promoting uh, uh, businesses and, and, and how we can actually integrate uh, the opportunities of partnerships and investment uh, in, in today's world. That notwithstanding, I. I also um, do lots of other, other things in terms of, uh, I, I'm also the director for the International Center for Protocol and Diplomacy, where we also promote um, uh, protocol and diplomacy among uh, ambassadors, uh, high commissions, and, and uh, within the diplomatic uh, uh, um, community. So I'm just gonna put my details there later on uh, for those of us who are interested in, in carrying on. So today's objective really is for us to explore how we can promote foreign direct investment from the UK into Ghana, you know, in terms of maximizing intra-African free trade opportunities uh, through the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Of course, we all know this has turned off since January 1st, 2020. And the big single market, you know, has an approximately 1.3 billion consumers. So that's quite huge. And Ghana is sitting in the center of that all. So today we're going to be talking about, you know, what are the benefits? And uh, we're also going to analyze the impact of investment and partnership collaborations as a way of boosting economic uh, growth for Ghana. One of the big questions really, I did some interviews uh, some months ago and the big question they asked was, is Africa really ready? Are we equipped um, um, you know, with this phenomenal tax, especially in terms of the implementation of the agreement 
taking into consideration the intricacies and complexities of bringing together over you know, 45 countries to agree on a common position. This is the big question we have in our minds today, and I'm sure our speakers will be able to give us a really defined solution uh, in terms of, of how we appraise that fact. And um, another thing is, you know, looking at some background facts on to, in, to, in terms of where we are today, um, we know that the, you know, the, the countries connected already on this agreement are around 55 countries. There's a huge 1.3 billion people uh, having that GDP um, of over uh, 3.4 trillion US dollars. That's quite big when we talk about AFTA. And another thing again is that it's going to provide over 40 countries uh, the unique opportunity within the region of uh, competitively trade and integrate into a global economy. These are main facts that we can't just walk away from. And, you know, it's also aimed that by 2035, uh, 30 million people will be lifted from, you know, extreme poverty and, 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 and 68 million people from that, from moderate poverty. So the focus is really how will this influence um, um, some of the sub-Saharan countries, especially Ghana. Uh, it would be good to hear uh, thoughts around that. And let's even look at um, UK-Ghana fact sheet. Uh, it, it really baffles me that total trade in goods and services as at um, the quarter one uh, in 2021 was, was over 856 million, million pounds. Uh, so bringing together the relationship uh, in terms of how the UK can actually uh, influence or you know influence uh, trade in Ghana, these are very significant facts, and our speakers today will really be telling us more about these factors. Another significant thing around the UK Ghana fact sheet um, it's so interesting to know that Ghana was the UK 77th largest trading partner in the last four quarters of the end of Q1 2021. And this is really significant. I'm sure with the last um, um, the trade uh, deal that went, went through, uh, these figures have actually really migrated in terms of the significant percentage uh, as that translates into Ghana. And today's sessions will, of, of course, be very informative. Uh, there's a lot for you to hear. It's going to be interactive as well. And uh, we are really going to showcase very experienced speakers who will share their market knowledge, especially Louis. Why well, I'm picking on Louis because uh, he's a uh, he's. I'm very, very, very fond of him because he's he's so passionate about AFTA and passionate about Ghana. Not like the others are not, but but expect a lot of uh, figures and statistics uh, from Louis uh, in terms of sharing all of that element coming from uh, AFTA and the agreements uh, in terms of what the UK is actually bringing into into the, the play. So today's topics, just to remind us, uh, we have doing business in Ghana, uh, investment and partnership collaborations, prospects and opportunities. Uh, someone is going to be talking, one of the speakers is going to do really justice to that, um, giving it a really close look in terms of figures, statistics, and, and what our expectations are in, in, the near, in the near years coming. Then, of course, we're going to have leveraging the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the landmark agreement with UK government to attract investors and accelerated growth is also the center of discussions today. So I just wanted to pay attention to uh, some of this value the speakers are going to be bringing. And most interestingly, I like digital transformation a lot because every one of us have transformed, whether we like it or not, uh, in terms of digital, the way we apply it to businesses, the way we apply it to our day-to-day -day lives. So um, digital transformation, technology and innovation, uh, a way of addressing Ghana's challenge. So at the end of the day, uh, I think the speakers, I'll get to introduce them later when they come on stage, um, will really do justice in terms of will, will digital transformation really, really um, change uh, uh, the issues or, you know, creates a, a way to address challenges in Africa and most importantly in Ghana. So these are really very, very key uh, issues uh, that we'll talk about today. So without wasting too much time, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, we want to go straight into the, into the discussions for today. I just thought I should take time um, 
um, to talk to you about what we do. Synergy Systems Consults UK Limited uh, is one of the sponsors for today. And by that uh, opportunity, we're just quickly uh, going to share what we do so that many of you could understand our, our, our role. Okay, so I'll quickly, I hope my slides are showing, am I? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure what I've done now. Um, we can see okay. it. Yeah, it's not giving me the last slide, it's just taking me to the... Uh, no. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I think we are good to go. Okay, so uh, we thought um, we could share with you uh, how we've been able to facilitate trade and investment partnerships. A little story uh, in terms of uh, into Africa and the kind of support uh, we've been giving to companies from here into Africa. And when you talk about Synergy Systems Consults UK Limited, the first thing that comes to mind actually is accelerating business growth, the power of synergy. So what we've done over the years is actually to, uh, to, to, to bring that power of synergy and create that supply chain between Africa and African country, I mean, African uh, network and, and UK network. And that has been really significant in terms of how we work with industry experts. Uh, we form the global network in terms of really promoting that transformation, transformative agenda uh, for the growth of uh, the African market. So the growth of the African market is quite really significant uh, in terms of uh, what we do. And um, taking that further, uh, we have a three-way approach. Of course, this is really relevant in today's um, post-COVID activities. If you talk about strategy in terms of business advisory and expansion, uh, in terms of goals and objective for organizations, we take our time to talk to businesses, we provide tailored um, advisory. We have a whole team uh, who are really keen on, on producing that. And in terms of planning, uh, we have a very tailored approach, working with chambers of commerce, like Global Chamber, of course, uh, and also other, other uh, chambers, of course, uh, to develop a corporate and growth strategy, uh, which promotes uh, business transformation across a wider range of uh, global sectors. And of course, implementation is very key in terms of execution, monitoring, and ensuring that deadlines uh, are met when it comes to our clients. And very quickly, I'll just do a quick one. Uh, when we talk about what we do, so from connecting opportunities I've mentioned before, to building emerging opportunities in terms of business transformation, uh, bringing together and building global interests for UK goods and services is quite key to us. So, um, and also delivering framework in terms of doing business overseas is really, really important uh, in, in, this, in the scheme of work uh, when, when, when we talk about uh, the services that we offer. And of course, research and development is also very important to us in terms of what's going on at, at the moment and, uh, and, and, and as far as uh, AFTA is also concerned. And I just mentioned that exploring business opportunities with AFTA, providing business advisory. So what we're doing is taking time, talking to businesses, really giving them insights of the opportunities that are open when it comes to the agreement. And uh, business growth, uh, of course, is through partnerships uh, in terms of redefining client base, in terms of developing capabilities, creating alignments when it comes to the opportunities in terms of supply chain, project management, and things like that. And of course, we give a really gearing in terms of changing the, the business model. So taking action at this time is very key. And of course, a bit of our results, uh, we're not going to put all that there, but just some significant, uh, we've, we've really increased the client base uh, with excess of millions of pounds for many of our clients significantly. Market entry support uh, for hundreds of our clients. We've increased uh, a lot of collaborations. Uh, we've also increased the success potential up to over 70%, significantly building emerging opportunities for business transformation, and also bringing together and building global interests, especially for UK goods and services. We've also delivered framework for doing business overseas and mentioned research and development. And on our training scheme, we've had over 200 delegates um, and, and, and travel um, businesses coming to the UK to actually explore the opportunities in terms of transforming uh, the businesses. And of course, some of our, of our partners we've worked with 
uh, in terms of uh, actually uh, promoting uh, business services. And that is all from me. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, that's the details there. I'm going to put it on the chat. So for some of us who want to have a tailored approach, please uh, reach out to us. So thank you for listening. Quite some long uh, five minutes. I hope you were able to pick one or two things from there. We'll go straight into uh, the, the, the discussions for the day. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Our first speaker for today, I hope I'm correct uh is uh david or for sudote am i correct is he there is, is david no. there let's go for lewis uh, who okay. Is, uh here. okay so we're gonna go for lewis your afro uh like i said before he's a big ambassador in terms of uh, in terms of uh after and uh today sorry about that today he's going to be talking about leveraging the african continental free trade agreement and also relating it to the landmark agreements with UK government uh, to attract uh, investors and accelerated growth into Ghana. Just to give you a background of Louis Yur Afo, he's a trade practitioner and the executive director of uh, the AFTA Policy Network, a really good uh, network which I belong to, and I will encourage people to join that network. Um, and he has a very strong private sector development skill. He was former finance director for a large retail group for over a decade, and he helped grow profits over 100%. That's quite really unique and significant. He was also a former country director of MIP Ghana and a management and exchange program firm based in the UK. He also was the CEO of commodity trading firm called Luby. Enterprise. Lewis has worked closely with international agencies like the African Union, um, the CFTA, a board member of uh, Globe Chamber of Commerce, a board member of Ghana Chamber of SMEs. He's also a team member of Seeds Dubai, a multinational group firm in the UAE. Yes, I know Seeds Dubai, they're really quite um uh, a good place to to work and lewis has also featured in many international conferences and international media interviews he's also a member of the technical working group of after in ghana ministry of trade and industry i can go on and on lewis was given citation recently by cfta units of the department of trade and industry of the african union for lead championing of after and at this point, I'd like to welcome one and only Louis Your Afro. This floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very great. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where to start from the elaborate. <laughs> uh, you said so many fine things about me. I'm grateful. Uh, good afternoon to all my co panelists and all members, wherever you are. I think uh, thank you also to Ruby. She's really caught me at the right time because I just have been off a week after I was bereaved. So I was off public activities for some time. And so I'm just coming out and I'm surprised she was able to uh, really win my time. And I, I really appreciate Global Chamber and this program. I appreciate this program as well. And uh, I, I look forward to, that to be a successful one. Thank you very much. Uh, where do I even start from? But looking at the question that you have posed to me, we are looking at the leveraging between continental free trade, and then we're looking at uh, investment or investors. And again, where the UK and Ghana partnerships will fall in. Um, I don't know whether I should go back to what this agreement is for the benefit of uh, those who uh, might not have known what it's all about. Basically, I think that the African continental free trade, it's uh, a process. It's a process of Africa's regional economic integration. When I say it's a process, process, what I mean is that the agreement signed is not the end way. It's not an event. It's a process that will take some time. We are looking at reaching the likes of EU. We are looking at reaching the likes of the North American uh, Free Trade Agreement. However, we need to understand that it's a process. We don't need to burden ourselves so much with the challenges at the onset, because trading started just early this year. It was supposed to have started last year. Uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement has produced a free trade area where 54 countries are ready to uh, liberalize a certain percentage of their commodities or goods and services at a certain agreed, uh, uh, what do you call it, tariff lines. 
over a period of some years. And that's why I say it's a process because at this stage, we are the free trade level. We are not, we don't have one custom union. So you have some dif uh, dis uh, disparities or differences in countries over another other countries. So what to be done at the borders might seem different from other borders. And it's, it's a process because at, the, at this time, uh, we are still trying to you know, connect the dots when it comes to the area of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, one market, we have not reached there yet. So we have issues with uh, currency issues, payment settlement issues, and, uh, and uh, above all, custom union issues. Apart from that, the continental free trade is good because uh, we were not trading among ourselves because most African economies had the same raw materials, similar raw materials, which were not value added, which were not finished products, attracting no value, attracting no higher price in the layman's words. So we felt that look, why don't we uh, look at our comparative advantages and begin to really leverage on each other by coming out to one common guidelines, the rules of origin, where we'll be in a preferential area, where we will try to, you know, uh, um, liberalize over a period of years, though we might not be having uh, uh, our revenues as we used to expect. But hey, one important thing that most African economies look like is that most of our tax revenues uh, are from import are not tax on imp import from within African countries. Most African economies have their taxes on imports from outside Africa. And so the continental free trade will not do so much bad to uh, revenue falls because of the liberalization of the tariff lines. That is one key thing that we need to understand. So the continental free trade uh, will see to it that we have a larger market access among ourselves, a population of more than 1.2 billion and a, a targeted GDP of also more than 2.3 trillion over a period of time. Because if you look at the annual expected revenue is far fetching, which is great. Most of the time we always peck the revenue to the commodity side, to the goods side. We don't look at the services because the services to me is one of the biggest areas from the World Bank report. It's almost about 50% to GDP. Most African economies have not been tapped. So under the continental free trade, certain arrangements have been done. And these arrangements, we will call them protocols. Some of them will call them at the committee levels. And one of the key Protocols we all know is a trading goods, trading services, and then after all, dispute settlement. But currently, we have the digital trade, which is also on board negotiation. It's not fully negotiated yet. And then uh, we have women and youth. I want to make a point that uh, under trade in services, we have about 12 sectors that will be very, very great for investors all over the world, especially in the UK. If there's a partnership agreement or partnership investment, to have in between these two countries. Why? Because under the trading services, you have 12 priority sectors. We call them 12 priority sectors. And these 12 priority sectors, we currently is only about five that have been agreed. I'm being pushing that the heads of states will rush with what we call the health one and then the education, because we know what COVID is teaching us. And so currently the five priority areas that are in force are the transportation. Transportation is huge. Transportation is a big issue here. The goods have been produced. How do they move? It's a question that we need to answer. And so if partners want to really take advantage of this, you can look at that sector, transportation. It takes care of aviation, takes care of rail, takes care of road, it takes care of maritime. Because we all know, I don't want to talk about the problems because I'll be happy to see British Airways coming into partnership with companies here. I want to see the likes of major uh, European airlines having partnership agreements with uh, uh, member yes, states, in, which is very, very, very important. Cool. Because cool sometimes if you go to uh, places like Cairo, you have to go through Dubai and other places before you get to an African country from within an African country. So that sector has been liberalized. Then you look at another sector that has been liberalized that has to do with tourism. Now that the pandemic came, what is next for tourism? We're hoping that uh, what we have heard about the Omicron or whatever the name is, it's not going to hamper, and of course, it's, it's denying us of our Christmas every now and then. Because every time we enter into November, December, we hear of something else, either it goes up or either something else comes up. So we, tourism has been affected already. So we have to come out with virtual ways of, of, of having tourism or diversifying. 
So tourism, for example, it should, it should go beyond just destination travel. We should look at cultural, we should look at health tourism, we should look at so many infrastructure tourism and the likes. Ghana, for example, is the center of the earth. For those of us who don't know, we are latitude zero, longitude zero. And so it's the center of the earth, it's, a, it's an infrastructure tourism. So tourism has been liberalized. We can have a lot of sports tourism. And then you look at another key area that has to do with ICT, it has been liberalized. In other words, the regulatory authority or the regulatory framework under which companies can thrive has been liberalized. And so, for example, ICTs, I don't even want to talk about it. It is it's a, a million or a world of million uh, uh, opportunities under ICT. Telecoms are operating uh, uh, fairly here. And it's going to be based upon fair treatment under after Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And then you look at one other key area under the five, which has been liberalized. That has to do with uh, financial institutions and the professional bodies, because it is key. Your financial institutions are going to support uh, uh, the, the, the implementation of continental free trade. We need more investment banks. We need more infrastructure banks. But the infrastructure gap is so huge that we need to fill it together. And so even if you take the five that I've mentioned out of the 12 sectors which are yet to liberalize, and you take health and education, you take uh, other areas like, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, um, labor. There are a lot that we can look at. The, the important point is that commodities or goods that are produced within Africa or on an African soil attract an originating status. So whether the company is in the UK uh, is not the issue. Once the company finds itself on an African soil and produces from an African soil, you attract the originating status of produced or made in Africa. And that is good. And that is the integration that African continental free trade is really looking at. And so one of the critical areas that I would like to, before I, I rest my point is that the continental free trade will move into an arena of really making sure that SMEs grow. And so I remember the Secretariat, the Secretary General was pushing for a funding of over $1 billion to support SMEs. To this end, we have regional banks like Afriasian Bank supporting in that regard. But that is not enough. It's not enough because you are looking at SMEs right from startups Apart from these startups, you are looking at the intellectual property issue. Beyond intellectual property issue, you are looking at their competition. Beyond that, you are looking at their product harmonization or registration. Beyond that, you are looking at the market, how you, you transport the goods to the available market. All these support gaps, all these support chain must be there to enhance an effective SME. So it is an area that financial institutions can target. In fact, the continental free trade is driven by seven pillars. The seven pillars are, are, are what we call more or less the guiding principles by which member states should implement after. We call them the BIAT, or what we call the BIAT, boosting into African trade. And the seven pillars, that will be the kind of leak if member states are supposed to be rated, which country is doing well per the seven pillars of the continental free trade. And one of them is what we call trade finance. You come with trade information, you look at trade uh, infrastructure, then you look at market uh, market segmentation, then you also look at factor productivity, and then you're looking at trade policy. It's about seven. And even if you take trade information, sometimes it's sad, but if you want information about trade within some African countries, you have to go to the World Bank to pick data, which is not a good idea. So what the continental free trade will be doing is that all information about member states their tariff lines, their tariff uh, exchanges, the rules of origin will be, will be uh, published within a website called the Africa Trade Observatory. And that is very important for an investor. So the Africa Trade Observatory will be like a website. If you want information about which country is trading what, which country is exchanging what, which country is, which tariff lines, what all will be published there. If a country changes its tariff lines, it will be published there. That is under trade information. And in the same way, it is based upon the trade information that will help uh, the digital trade that is also about to un be onboarded. Because the information you have about the kind of import and uh, export balance in a country will help you to know the market you are going. For example, I know that if you go to Seychelles, a lot is not being produced. And they depend so much also on import and tourism. So if I am somebody in the UK, what will be my next uh, 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 interest. Maybe I can look into the, and I, I'm very happy that CC is about to uh, diversify the economy. 
that is one of the areas I'm looking at. So you, we, 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 you take these pillars that really guides the implementation of after and see where your company fits. We have a lot of regional value chains. If you're in agribusiness, among the seven pillars I've mentioned, where do you sit? For example, you might not be an exporter of the final product, but you can be within the chains. This is what I've been telling the youth. You might not be at the point where you can export fully, but you can be part of the exportable chain. You can be part of the supply chain. And that is what the continental free trade, I have left out the principles. I want to go straight to the point, what exactly the continental free trade can benefit us and benefit investors who are really keen in coming in. And mind you, within, uh, 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 within the next few years, whatever will happen in, uh, in Mali will be the same as Malawi. Whatever will happen in uh, Gabon will be the same as happening in Ghana. It's a fair ground for every country. No country is a big player under continental free trade. Thank you. Louis, thank you so much. That was quite a lot in a short time. Uh, I was trying to get notes and uh, I just couldn't stop. My hands couldn't stop. So you've said very, very significant uh, uh, things uh, in terms of uh, statistics and information and uh, the way things are. I wouldn't be doing all the talking. I think probably we could just take a few questions or make it interactive a bit and uh, I'll just leave the floor open. Uh, before we go on, Katie or Ruby, do you have one or two things to say? Before I, we I, yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Lewis. I was busy writing a lot of notes there. There was a lot of information, but very useful. And I do have a couple of questions. Like uh, first one for uh, myself as the head of partnerships for Currents UK working in the international payment space. I did hear you talk briefly about the impacts um, on payment issues for traders. And I wondered if you could then um, expand on that a little bit more, um, because I know a lot of people on here would be managing currency exposure and I work with a lot of people in that space. So it'd be quite useful to understand what those impacts will be. All right, thank you, Kati. Well, um, under the continental free trade, before it came, we were already trading and having payments issues. Uh, transfer was a big problem trans, uh, among traders. People find it difficult uh, denominating currencies when they are paying their suppliers. Now, the African continental free trade has introduced what we call the PAPS, Pan-African Payment System, which has been piloted by the African Bank. The purpose of that payment system is a settlement payment. And what it means is for cross-border payments, cross-border trade. So in those days, um, before this agreement, if I want to trade with somebody in Nigeria and from Ghana, my currency is serious. And so I'll have to denominate in dollar in order to get the, the, the Naira, and which was a problem because one, timing, availability, and liquidity issues. But with this one, what Afriyazin Bank has done is to coordinate all central banks, African central banks, and hook them to that, that platform. And so what it happens is that I can transfer money to my supplier who is in a different country within my own currency and he or she will receive it in their own currency without going through the exchange issue. And that is one of the things that is very important. And secondly, the timing is very fast because it's on a, a digital platform, which is very, very key. And it helps with the, once the central banks are all hooked up to it. Like it makes clearing even a, a, a non-starter. That is just one phase of the PAPS. And it's important because at the end of the day, uh, we are trying, we, have, it, it doesn't solve the one currency issue, but it helps with payment and transfers. And also it helps because maybe uh, looking at the currency volatility among countries, I might need more maybe Naira or somebody in Nigeria might need more CDs to enable he or she to really make payment. But with this settlement platform, as I said, you transfer within the values of your currency denomination. You don't have to exchange it in another currency before. So the opportunity for most uh, 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 investors is that um, you there, there are so many, uh, what do you call it, uh, e-payment systems that will be hooked to these kind of uh, settlement uh, program. There was a company in Australia that was trying to come up with what we call the butter trade. Oh uh, yeah, butter card, uh, butter system. But uh, it's like a form of commodity. There's an also opportunity in terms of uh, gold. So what I'm trying to say is that that is the meaning of the uh, payment system that is developed currently 
supposed to assist after members in terms of their uh, uh, payment system. Very interesting, Lewis, and thank you for clarifying that in more detail. I think that's something I'd like to investigate further and I'll be reaching out to you. I do have a question from the, uh, the audience today as well. So I'm just going to read this out. Some key challenges that hinder the smooth operations of the APCA are the issues of rule of origin, competition policy and dispute settlement. What, in your opinion, should the private sector do or contribute to ensuring that non-African products do not take advantage of the Africa to flood our markets? Thank you very much. That's a very wonderful question, Kati. Uh, basically, anytime you call in for free trade, you should be prepared for competition. Anytime you are moving into a free trade agreement, that country must know that you are opening up for competition. That is the first, that is the baseline. Secondly, what is the guiding principle is the rules of origin. And after the rules of origin is about 87% ready. It's not full yet because there are a lot of few negotiations going on for the 12%. And one of the key areas has to do with the value additions and then automobile, the automobile industry. There are few issues going on among members. Now the issue is that of the 87 or 86 that have been negotiated, wholly made, partially made, and value addition. These are going to be driving principles of the rules of origin, such that it is impossible any product that is not made in Africa, once the product is coming outside Africa into the preferential area, will attract duties. That is why it is very, very important for countries that are having who are gone out of their way to have certain partnership agreements to be very, very careful. Say that you can have partnership agreements. Ghana has partnership agreement with the UK. But I think that such agreements can be based on input manufacturing uh, uh, based tariff lines, not products that are within the preferential treatment area. Because if within the preferential treatment area, the rules of origin say that you cannot give preferential treatment to an outside, a third party country, and then give a most favored nation approach treatment to a member country that will not work. And so they must be guided by that principle that yes, any product which is coming outside Africa, which is not within the tariff lines, within the member states will not be free, will attract duties. And it has been happening already. That is the biggest uh, difference that we have to understand. So that will be something that will help to guide certain products that are not made in Africa to find itself on the market of Africa. These are very, very key. Why? For example, one of the ways to help is the customs, custom entry points. Every customs and the AFTA is supposed to ensure what we call the harmonized codes of after products. And that is a bit of a challenge that currently they are facing. It's not every country and the after now that has been able to really adjust its single windows to harmonize the codes and say, this is an after product. This is not an after product. This is from an after country. This is not from after. That is a bit of challenge. This is where we are moving towards now. It's not, we are not fully there yet. So you might find it difficult that you might come to Ghana and our system is ready, you might move to the next country if they are not ready. And so it's a gradual process on that. But when all things are said and done, the rules of origin within this perspective is how it's going to guide uh, 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 the trading and how an, a product that is not within an Af made from an African soil or not within the tariff lines will not will attract duties. Thanks, Lewis. Oh, Oh. Okay, I think I think we need to take the second uh, speaker, if I'm okay with that. Okay, uh, well, we've got Fatima and Eric that have questions. So Fatima and Eric, do you want to hold on to your questions to the end? And um, we'll bring uh, yeah, it wasn't a question. Or maybe we could Sorry, just it wasn't one, a more, question. one more yes. Uh, yes. comment yes. and we'll, we'll move to the next thing. Okay, okay Fatima, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it wasn't a question. I think it was to answer the question um, that was asked. One of the things that is very crucial for you to realize if you do want to play in the continental free trade is value addition, right? And you might be aware right now that there is the EPA interim agreement, which is a European, European tax agreement that is already live, the interim one. And there's also a UK agreement that is also live, which yeah. means, you know, already... Um, tariff barriers have been considered into that. 
Now, anything that you would be looking at or anyone that's coming in as an investor, one of the things that they should really consider is playing in the value chain um, rather than coming in and looking at it from a perspective of exporting to Ghana. Um, because obviously with the Silk Road and the impact that it has had right now in terms of China still being the cheapest producer, um, to be competitive against any of the market is purely going to be based on each individual country's um, strength um, versus opportunities um, across the four countries. So that is just one clarification. Um, and I'd like that to be noted because if you do come in and say that, you know, it's, not, it's one part about uh, job creation, but the other part is, okay, how can we ensure that upstream, downstream um, is connected? And like he rightly said, um, logistics is one of the key challenges and one of the key areas of opportunity as well. So how can the resources be used to turn into value added products? Thank you. All right, Fatima, thank you for that uh, contribution. Uh, quite useful. Uh, we'll just quickly take from Eric. Eric, maybe just a minute. Let's hear what you have to say, Eric. Yeah, uh, the, the gentleman mentioned counter trade. Are there counter trade banks in London or anywhere on the continent of Africa that you're aware of? Uh, okay. Currently, not as I am well, but uh, it's something that uh, people are looking into. Okay. All right. I think, uh, yeah, I think that was quite another good point. Um, it's been very interactive. Uh, I'm enjoying it myself, and I'm happy for all the contributions that have come in. Uh, from all of our participants. It's quite really good. So we'll quickly go into the next uh, discussions. And thank you, Louis Afo, for your time, uh, for sharing us, uh, sharing with us that all that information in terms of uh, the African trade uh, continent of the trade agreement. So we'll quickly go into the next uh, speaker. Um, I'll quickly introduce Antonio Chombani. And uh, Antonio is going to be talking to us today. Um, just a moment, let's hold on. Yeah, Antonio is gonna be talking to us about, um, just a moment, yeah. He's gonna be talking to us about digital transformation, technology and innovation, a way to addressing Ghana's challenges. Um, Antonio, are you there? So I'll just quickly, Thank you. yeah, oh, that's good. Antonio, welcome. <laughs> so I'll just quickly read uh, a profile on, on Antonio. Um, Antonio is very passionate about um, digital transformation. He's really, really very passionate. He's done great work in terms of uh, digital transformation. He's a manager, managing director at GBIT Recruitment Limited. And like I said before, passionate about technology and skills. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Tech Expo Humber, uh, which is like they have a Tech Week Humber, if I'm correct, and uh, is an international event held in the region to recognize local tech talent and businesses. He's worked with so many talented people in terms of technology, and he also encourages more young people into tech. I'm very, very passionate about young people, so I like that uh, very well. And he also promotes... Um, uh, regions as a place to do business in terms of uh, showcasing the best tech coming out of that region. Uh, so if we're talking about Ghana today, I'm sure he's going to tell us a lot about what can come out of Ghana or what he has impacted in terms of transformation and uh, digital transformation, I mean. So as the MD of GBIT Recruitment Limited, uh, he has a great team. They work tirelessly uh, to help uh, clients find their best talent for their businesses. That's key. I think I have to come to you then. Um, and most inspiring thing, he was, he was actually named uh, in the top most 50 inspiring, prominent and influential black voices in the UK tech. Very well done. And he was also voted in the 20th most inspire, inspiring businesses leaders in Hull and East Yorkshire and also a member of the Forbes business. I will stop here at this point and introduce Antonio on the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thanks everybody for having <laughs> me. First of all, can I just say, I too, I love Ghana. It's brilliant. 
<laughs> you know, Thanks big so up much. Ghana, big up Ghana. <laughs> so yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, for having me. Yeah, like Patricia introduced me kindly there, you know. But one of the things that I also do, Patricia, is I work with a lot of global brands and help them expose sort of, you know, the products and brands throughout the world. Uh, I do a lot of work okay. in Africa, you know, from a digital perspective. I work in, in countries such as Angola, uh, Mozambique, uh, Cape Verde. Uh, South Africa, so a lot of African countries. And now myself, I'm originally from Africa. I'm from Mozambique. So I was born in Africa, in Mozambique, very passionate about helping African businesses use technology to, to expand their growth and, and, and digital uh, transformation, really, to grow into new markets. Um, so I think the world is a, is, a, is a quite an exciting time as well, you know, at the moment, you know, it's, the world's become very small uh, because of the pandemic and because of COVID. It's become a small world and digital transformations at the center of every single business. So this creates a, a fantastic opportunity for African businesses, specifically from Ghana, looking at expanding into new markets. So there's a lot more opportunities that are available for, for businesses now. You know, for example, right, we're in a Zoom call right now. I mean, I'm in Yorkshire, in cold Yorkshire. You guys are over there. So the, that should really present opportunities naturally for any business that's looking to, to expand internationally. And the UK market is quite an exciting market for any, any Ghanaian business that's looking to enter the market. There's a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, across the UK market. I think the Middle East market is also very exciting. I work quite a lot in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. I do a lot of work there. I work with a lot of brands that are entering those markets, you know, out of Africa into those markets. So whether you're in manufacturing, construction or agriculture, there's a lot of products out there that can really expand, help you expand your, your business. And innovation and digital is obviously at the center of everything we do. One of the key things that people tend to ask me is, okay, so what we're looking at is digital. I don't understand what you mean that I can sell my product from Ghana to, to the UK, right? Okay, e-commerce. E-commerce is kind of the first thing that comes to mind. It's a very big market, an open market. So anybody can actually sell e-commerce products. And you know, if, you, if it's a product that is sellable through e-commerce, you can do that. I mean, social media is big as well. So you can sell your products via social media. But everything starts from an educational perspective. You know, you've got to educate yourself and understand actually, you know, how, what do I need to do? What are the processes that I need to take? I think, you know, just to mention the fantastic work that the Global Chamber is doing by putting these meetups together is something that you need to get involved. You know, you can get involved in networking events that I've done virtually. Trade missions are being done virtually at the moment. There's a lot of trade missions. I work very close with the Department of International Trade. I work with some of the ministers and, and everybody from the DATR Whitehall. We're always doing trade missions that are virtual. So get involved in that, you know ask the right questions. I've noticed that there's some fantastic business consultants here that offer trade and investment opportunities. So get talking to them, set up webinars and meetups, you know, online meetups. So all that is using technology and digital transformation. But as a, as a starting point from a journey perspective, you need to understand your business capabilities and your workforce capabilities to understand what digital aspects you need to focus on. And I think that's really key. So once you know what, what are the digital aspects and how digital digitally your business is, then you can start looking at what, to, what steps to take next. I mean, everybody's on LinkedIn at the moment. You know, that's a digital asset as well, tool that you can use to link up with new businesses, network, connect with new people, meet up new people. Your customers are probably all sat on LinkedIn right now. I mean, what are the numbers now? Is it 750 million, right? So everybody's actually not on LinkedIn and everybody, every business is there. So there's more opportunities to really export your product, you know, by linking up and connecting with people over there. Um, Another thing that I say a lot, you know, depending on your demographics of your customer base, things like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok nowadays, you know, the clients are everywhere. So it's about understanding your strategies as a business. What are you doing with digital? How are you utilizing your profile as a business to reach a new market? And if you're targeting a new market, don't just look at other the market as a country focus on major cities for example if you want to trade in london you know make those links with london you know people like katie are fantastic in terms of connecting you with the, the right sort of links and networks speak to your local embassies use those that information that is available for you to be able to get into those markets and i think the african market is really exciting we've got some fantastic products and services that we can use innovation and technology to get into those markets i mean one thing that I also mentioned 
is, you know, create your own digital product, create your own mobile application. How's your website? Is your website mobile friendly? Can people read it properly? Can, get, can they get in touch with you? So all that falls in place as part of your digital transformation process, you know? And if you put your, your Ghanaian number there, you know, has it got the plus 2333, three, three, you know? Do you have a chatbot there? You know, a lot of websites now offer the ability to you to have a chatbot. So if you're in different time zones, your chatbot in your website can start talking to your customers getting the information and leading to you back to your customer and getting all that lead generation started. That's a really key point to really look at. So that forms part of your digital strategy, uh, your digital transformation. But again, I'll reiterate this again. It all starts with a review of your current status, of your current situation as a business, right? I mean, I, 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 can, I believe a lot of you potentially could really be exporting your products, whether it's a product or a service, you know, whether you're a consultant, there's a lot of work that can be done. And we help a lot of clients do this, you know, with, with our with our with, with our business that are you know exporting and entering new markets. Um, Identify your key partners in those countries, start talking to them through digital, you know, you know, reach that, reach out with them, use all those digital tools. And that's really kind of, you know, my, my advice is from a digital perspective. Now, there are probably some of your companies that are probably much bigger, that you probably have big, bigger challenges, as in, you know, what is your infrastructure from a, from a technical perspective? You know, have you got the right equipment, you know, the right software, the right products, the right computers, or the right, um, you know, customer relation uh, uh, tools and products? So those are kind of the stuff that we work with a lot of businesses globally, and we understand their business, and we help working with other local consultants to really work with you and help you expand your business and start to export uh, you know it was only actually today that i was speaking to a company that's actually looking at entering ghana from france so you know they're looking at bringing products from ghana to you know to from france to ghana so it's quite exciting market to be exporting you know and one thing good out of covid not that it's probably there's not many of good things that have come out of COVID, is that the world's become much a smaller place. You know, we're so accessible, we really are. And it's just about encouraging and understanding your digital assets, what your digital transformation process looks like and implementing a digital strategy. Every business is digital, as they say, they just don't probably, some of them just don't, don't understand how digital they are. So that's really an overview of, our, of what we do about digital transformation and digital strategy. You know, I'm more than happy to take questions. I, I love taking questions. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. We've, we've got Robert who's got a question. Would you like to come to the stage, Robert? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I don't have my camera on. I hope everyone can at least hear me very well. Uh, Mr. Yes. Antonio, I'm so glad. Uh, um, by uh, uh, everything you just said. Uh, my name is Robert. I uh, work uh, uh, with uh, Top Kife. Uh, we are a team of uh, young Togolese engineers. Uh, I currently live in the US, but we're currently trying to build the best e-commerce platform to allow cross-border shopping. We actually did a soft launch only a few weeks ago, so you guys Fantastic. most likely never heard of us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I actually came across uh, um, everything uh, concerning the Africa uh, quite recently, actually, and uh, um, I was actually very glad that I came across this, you know, happening today. Uh, as someone that knows about digital transformation, how big of an impact do you think this will have on e-commerce? Because we, we, again, like I said, we're building logistics and uh, we're hoping the next two years people living in Ghana should be able to, you know, buy stuff easily from topkife.com and, you know, between Togo and Ghana, most of our customers, just, that's like the biggest thing that I guess they like about us and everything we're working on. So uh, like how that the after, because I've spent a lot of time looking into it, I couldn't really find much information about, you know, like the e-commerce side, or the, the digital side of, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. No, uh, first of all, congratulations on setting up your business. You know, it's such an endearing thing to hear another entrepreneur setting the digital business and e-commerce business here and out of Africa as well. I think the African continent as a whole, we've got such a fantastic opportunity to really, you know, go and take over the world from a digital perspective. And our infrastructure now is really allowing us to do that. You know, connectivity is number one, right? We need to have the right connectivity such as internet and, you know, and broadband, you know, fast connectivity and broadband. And, you know, I was just talking to Google a couple of weeks ago, and they're investing billions and billions of pounds into African infrastructure. And there's a lot of other telecoms companies that are really doing this to allow more access and digital transformation. 
And the second thing that I would say is education. We need to educate businesses and give businesses confidence to understand and to know what tools are available, readily available for them to be able to start exporting and, you know, and trading globally. The opportunity is huge, right? There's an opportunity for every business in Africa to be able to access, you know, exporting opportunities worldwide. Obviously, finance comes with that as well, right? having readily available finance for businesses to be able to export and trade internationally using those digital tools is very important but it takes people like yourself robert who's actually starting up a, a tech business in, in itself you know an e-commerce business to really start pushing that message and getting involved in things like this that you know the the, the team at global chamber are, are doing such a fantastic job is also key these are kind of things where you're going to meet people such as you know everybody here in this room that can really start making things happen and i think you know education you know one thing i'll say education is really key but the impact is massive it's a really big impact that we can make as a as a, as a, as a continent not just a, obviously as, as ghana as well okay thank you for your uh, for your answer. i appreciate it because recently i remember having a discussion like that with uh, uh, another I guess African brother where I was talking about my business and one answer he gave me was that uh, he thinks e-commerce is too much of a common place in Africa and I was like well I left the continent very recently so to say e-commerce is a very common place I personally believe is a big mistake and no, like no, I said uh, we have our work we hope in the next few years you know me again living yeah. in the US I should be able to start buying things from yeah. Ghana from Togo and easy but yeah so you know again this is definitely a good thing to know about and uh, with all the work that people are doing and just like you said you know this is our own thing to do. Absolutely. yeah thank you yeah thank no you. thank you okay thanks um Katie you still have a few questions yeah, we do. I do actually. And, and thanks, Antonia. I really love where you're going with that. And I know we had a really amazing conversation the other day and you're doing a lot of great work around the globe right now. And I want to, you know, what can you say to people on the call now? There's a few questions on the chat. I think you really answered the last one about how can we get funding? How is the infrastructure going to work with technology in Ghana? Because it's a little bit behind at the moment. So we'd like to see more support in that space. So you might be able to continue to expand on that but also how where do people start what is the first step for them if they're not doing anything at all with technology what how they how can they learn more yeah i think uh, you know I, I think you probably alluded that earlier on thanks for the question katie is that i think the first thing you need to really understand is is where you are you know you know and i think it's a you know i mean we work with a lot of businesses and we help them understand the whole process but you know it takes it's a very simple there's a lot of you know free tools that are available online which you know you can really start looking at you know as your business you know for example have you got the right website you know these are the basic things that you need to really be seeing you know what is your brand i've you got your facebook uh, business pages have you got your linkedin business page you know those are the basic things that i think businesses should really be looking at and i think you know i i, I mean I, I vouch for linkedin right linkedin is a fantastic tool that everybody should really have in this call and you know should really start to sort of you know, develop your the bigger picture from you know your business from there on uh, but there are some tools that are available that are free of charge i mean i'm more than happy to sort of you know take the call out and then speak to people differently who really want to kind of you know understand more from a from a basics understanding of where they need to begin from I'm getting a bit of a noise. I don't know where it's coming from. Oh, yeah, kind it's of coming from uh, um, yeah. yeah, so you have a diagnostic tool as well that you could... Yes, we do have a diagnostic tool that we, we know we'll definitely you know get it shared with everybody here. Yeah. So you'll be able to sort of you know link up on that diagnostic tool and then load up your information, and the diagnostic tool will then tell you where at what position you are as a business and what you need to consider doing from a digital transformation perspective. And I think it's really important just a comment that you made about just the very basic level of having a website, being visible, having the right channels of communication because more British businesses will want to connect and partner when they can see you and they connect, can connect with you in the right way. And I think yes. that that small mechanism to have in place can also bridge many gaps in terms of how we work together across borders. And so I think that's extremely important. And, and Patricia, there is one more question, but it sort of goes towards Lewis and towards Antonio as well. And it's around the manufacturing sector. I know um, 
Lewis, I had a question for you, like what can Africa do to support businesses that are looking to manufacture in Ghana? You know, are there any incentives to encourage foreign companies to set up? Um, but also, Antonio, you might be able to add to that in some way because you do work with a lot of manufacturing companies as well. So I know that was a big question that I had for both of you. So I don't know who, who wants to pick it up first. I'll let Lewis go first. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation, uh, uh, Antonio. Thank you. I think that the, from what I enumerated earlier, the continental free trade provides the pillars by which every government or every economy should lead the way. And so being in manufacturing or being it regional value chains or being it any form of sectoral development, the government has to lead the way provide the baseline of structure, and then the private sector is supposed to be on board or be partners. Now, in terms of supporting, in Ghana, for example, you have the export, uh, Ghana Export Promotion Authority, you have Ghana Export Promotion Authority work closely hand in hand with the Ministry of, of Trade, because the Ministries of Trade are the supervising agencies of the implementation of African continental freedom within every member state. And so the Ministry of Trade coordinates all these sectors. The Sogana has interministerial committee. In fact, it has delayed by December. There was a launch Ghana's agenda for after, which was out of interministerial committee. I happen to be one of, on, on one of the boards on the technical working groups. So these technical working groups were drawn from various sectors. And then we made our recommendations, we worked on it. So it, took, it went to cabinet. And so after cabinet, then it has gone far as presidential consent. So within that agenda, it's going to now look at how it can connect various associations, like the Association of Ghana Industries, the Ghana Chamber of Commerce, and various industry players, and to see how best they can both be supported, their members can be on board. And we know the key area that needs support is finance. So Ghana is using the Ghana Exim Bank to support some of these calls. Apart from the Ghana Exim Bank, you're looking at GEPA, as I said, they have developed a 10-year development plan. That 10-year development plan is called NET, is to expand on non-traditional commodities as well. Apart from that, then you're looking at other organized, other institutions to help in the area of, let's say, infrastructure. Infrastructure. So Ghana, for example, has come out with a new bank that is almost like it's called the Ghana, uh, Ghana Development Bank. And that is going to focus keen on development. And so if you ask me with respect to Ghana, this is how far Ghana has gone. And Ghana is moving to the next phase where they are going to really uh, uh, integrate various associations like the Ghana team of SMEs. And so uh, I think that uh, the representative from Ghana, Association of Ghana Industries, I saw, I forgot her name, she's on this platform. She'll be able to tell us more what government is doing to uh, their association, because I know a lot has been done so far. Ghana, Ghana Chamber of Commerce, for example, have been given one of the authorities, or they have been given authorization to uh, ensure people, trans, uh, people, uh, what do you call it, uh, export under after. The recent budget that was read in Ghana, government is going to support 200 companies, 200 companies to export under after. That is very, very significant. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'll just add yeah. to what uh, sort of, you know, what, what Louis said. I think, you know, it's very important to create those incentives and create sort of, you know, an environment where, you know, from an inward investment for investment coming into Ghana, it's actually not quite accessible. And, you know, making readily available information for manufacturing businesses that are looking at setting up in Ghana, you know, to understand the whole process. Because usually how what we find is that, you know, they start talking to the embassies, also the Department of International Trade and whatnot. But I think, you know, as a nation, there needs to be almost like a, a joint up approach on how you attract inward investment. Uh, that's kind of what I'll probably add to that, Katie. Okay, this is really interesting. I've learned so much and I'm really looking, you know, getting to learn more. So I, I, I think I appreciate the speakers. Uh, Louis, you did a fabulous job. Antonio, that was just um breathtaking in terms of digital yeah. transformation and how that application could actually help businesses 
Um, and, and very good questions coming through from uh, the, the participants today. Um, so we, we just thought we should have a, a bit more discussion because we have uh, one of our speakers who's traveling. Uh, so there's a bit of difficulty in terms of really connecting. So apologies on his behalf. Um, there's quite some difficulty reaching, you know, connecting. So apologies for, for that. So why that is uh, going on, uh, we would like to just hear a bit more from uh, the floor, um, your thoughts. I know there are quite some questions. I'm sure we've taken all the questions, Katie. I think we've taken all the questions. Yes, we have. Well, we've taken most of them, but I, I feel like if people have discussions, yes. ideas, just to put your yeah. hand up or jump in. So, so just before then, we have somebody from the World Economic Forum. Um, is that Jewel Banner? Am I correct? Um, if you don't mind, just share one or yes. two things yes. with us here. Jewel, really appreciate that you held on till this time. Uh, that's quite uh, really helpful. So we might just want to hear your thoughts, uh, looking at it from the World Economic Forum. Uh, what do you think in terms of the discussions today and how do you think Ghana sits in? And of course, I would like to know from you, you uh, your thoughts around AFTA. Uh, the big question is really practical, if this is gonna work, if it's working. Lewis has given a really holistic approach in terms of how we see the potential. Uh, so Joa, your thoughts will really be helpful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And, and I won't say that you, you put me on the, on the spot. Uh, yeah, I'm, put, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry about <laughs> no, that. Pleasure, pleasure to, to participate as, as a proud Ghanaian, although I've been sitting in Johannesburg for, for 20 years now. Um, it's actually interesting that you that you asked me, because we've actually, I'll touch on two things. We've been doing two things over the last year or so, actually working right out of the office of the president in Ghana, where we, we actually launched a country financing roadmap study for Ghana right out of the office of the president to say, how does Ghana crowd in more private sector capital, you know, to kind of stimulate into investment into areas that support the sustainable development goals. And obviously trade and investment was, was core to, to this. Um, I'll, I'll just try and get one of my colleagues, I'll share a link to, to that report. And, and, and it touched on a number of interventions that both the public and private sector can look at. Following on from that, we've actually been working again with the Ministry of Finance in the affordable housing sector and, and trying to unpack some of the work there and in the, in, in, in the SME sector. I heard colleagues talking about that. So that's just some more broad work we've been doing um, with Ghana, but very specific on the continental free trade agreement. I want to come at it from a very different angle. We've been engaging directly with the Secretariat about how do you make it work? And the interesting thing, and I know somebody said, earlier that when you eventually there'll be no difference when you go from Ghana or to a, to a Gabon. Actually, the question when you get to trade has been the big question and everybody's talking about what needs to be ratified. But what we've been discussing is how do you actually get trade to work across the borders? When you jump from Ghana into Burkina Faso, the economic realities are totally different. So we're saying we've started to look at how do you look at trade enabling infrastructure, be it power, be it transport, be it digital, because if you're going to take goods across the border, the cost of taking goods of cost across the border changes dramatically when you go from one market to another, purely based on access, purely based on the things around, you know, the digital infrastructure across the different markets. So that's, that's just some work that we've been thinking about, particularly with the Secretariat directly in Ghana, and, and something that we at the World Economic Forum We'll be doing more work in in 2022 to actually think through these issues and how do you get the key question there was how do you get private sector capital to come in to come and support the much needed trade enabling infrastructure to make the AFC FTA work and, and I'll have I'll be happy to have to, to have uh, you know more discussions around that how do you get some of the, the legal issues around that to make sure that you're actually bringing countries you know onto a closer playing field that would allow and, and talk, because when you go to Europe and talk about Europe, the European free trade area, yes, you have different countries, but it's a totally different dynamic if you're talking about some of the countries. I mean, just take the West Africa region and yeah. talk about the economic realities in, the, in that area. So how do you superimpose a continental free trade agreement on that? So these are just some initial thoughts 
um, of what of what we are doing and what we are working on at the World Economic Forum, right um, with the government of Ghana. But but happy to chat more in this session or other sessions, and also bilaterally with with colleagues. I put my details in 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 the in, in the chat. And the last thing I'll say on this is a very interesting thing. Someone talked about the airlines and traveling. Now I'm stuck in Johannesburg. I was supposed to get to Af um, Africa Development Bank for Africa Investment Forum. But to fly in Africa now, I had to use Emirates, and we all know what happened on the weekend. So, so these are the practical things. You know, Emirates just pulled the plug, and we couldn't get on a plane. You know, I was going to fly to Dubai to get to Abidjan. So, how, how do we start to think about that, those kind of issues? You know, and, and these are real practical daily issues that we need to think about that also start to affect affect trade. But I think I've spoken more than my my two minutes, and just want to. Touch oh, that's on. all right. <laughs> We're enjoying <laughs> what you're saying. What you yeah, shared is so. quite key. Oh, really good. So, Joel, thanks for that. That's quite uh, really informative in terms of what is happening at the moment. I'm very impressed about what you've said around the financial roadmap in terms of what you're doing exactly with the with the office directly. So, I think people should be uh, should know this thing. So, if you can share the link. Uh, you said you're going to share uh, some of the link and it would be good if you put your details on uh, for some of us who want to reach you uh, after the meeting. So if you don't mind, you can give us your details. So thank you again, Joel. That was quite really good. Um, as it is, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a few, one or two, three questions. And uh, I'm sure we're going to wrap up uh, uh, very quickly. Can I, uh, sorry, but I wanted to make a little remark. If it's possible. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, Joel made uh, fantastic observations. Um, the, he made uh, a point about the legal framework, one aspect of the legal framework and how, if after coup, um, how countries could be coordinated. And that, that. I think that is key. But one thing is that um, uh, initially, I remember I didn't want to go deep down the uh, some of the literature. But yeah. one thing that after has moved on or move forward is that, you know, three protocols have been negotiated and it's enforced fully, trading rules services, and then dispute settlement, which is very, very key. And under dispute settlement, we are going to empanel uh, legal uh, lawyers, a kind of rule is going to be, uh, be uh, prepared. Now, one of the areas is that the uh, continental free trade the architecture is such that the Secretariat is an organ under the African continent, African Union Commission. And the Secretary General holds an AUC, Deputy Chair of the AUC. So he wields a lot of commanding uh, uh, power or respect, such that he can drive a lot of presidents along. That is one of the significant of his office, such that offices at commission levels within the African Union he is above that. And so when he tells us when there is something he wants to see it happen, he tells us it before the African ministers of trade and then at summits, heads of state summits, if it's adopted, it is taken. The difficulty is that the secretariat cannot on their own come out with certain initiatives which might not be accepted by the heads of state. So for example, the phase one is done, phase two, which has to do with intellectual property, competition, investment, they are currently at a committee level. We don't call them protocols because that's not been tailored at the heads of states. And so the countries themselves, one of the ways that they can help is that they should really, at the ministerial level, fast track things and then support the secretariat at summit so that this could be approved on time. That is that is one of the things that this, uh, the Africa Agreement, the Continental Victory Agreement is really going to look into because if it delays, the private sector is the one that is going to bear this bond. But at the end of the day, it comes from the government, the public sector, now we the private sector as opposed to play along. But no, the private sector also needs to be involved at the technical working groups of various ministries of trade. They need to be involved at the negotiation discussions when they are going to negotiate uh, some of these uh, sectors or protocols, which is very, very, very important. And he made one last important point, which I would like to also comment. Most countries, as it stands now, most countries, as it stands now, though they have ratified, there are only 41, about 41 who are full party state members. And if I say full party state members, it means that when as trading is happening, they can benefit. 
if you have not if you, are, you have ratified and you have not submitted your letters of ratification, you are not an after member. You are you have you can't benefit from trade. It means that you cannot benefit from tariff liberalization, which is a problem. And so, what it is important that some of them have ratified at uh, uh, at protocol level, but they have not submitted their letters and said, "Look, I finally, I'm fully finally ready for it." So we have 41 countries. It's all Eritrea which has no sign. Now make the differences. So the rest of the other country, what are they waiting for? What are they waiting for before they, they become full members? So as we move into 2022, for the private sector to really be integrated, all member states must become full after party actors so that they can be able to leverage, they can be able to share, they can be able to have harmonization of activities. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Louis. That was quite a good uh examination of what uh, Jewel has said. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, really uh, in, in harmony. So I think it's very well. Uh, we'll just uh, probably while we're looking at the legal framework, I thought I should call on Ni Sanusi. I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you. But we just need your thoughts around, uh, um, you know, from a legal framework, what, what do you think uh, in terms of the discussion so far? Is Ni Sanusi there? Ni, I saw you just now. Ni, okay, I'm not sure if he's still there. Okay, he, he's he's a very good uh, no, lawyer. I, I'm here, I'm here, I'm oh, actually Nii, here. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so we just wanted your thoughts around uh, the, the, the legal framework in terms of the discussions uh, from Louise and Jewel. I'm sure you've been listening. Uh, it would be good to hear some other things coming from you. Uh, well, honestly, everybody is still um, uh, watching us and waiting how it goes. I don't have much comments on the legal framework at the point at this point. Um, we are still watching. We are still studying some of these African AFC FTA provisions. What I can say is that um, it will be. It will take a while before we all get accustomed to what. Um, what this entails. First of all, Africa, as we all know, has a challenge with quite a number of things that can make the FCFTA work. One of them is infrastructure, uh, the digital market also, the digitalization of the continent, as a few people have pointed out, is also going to be a challenge. Um, one other thing, which is very key, as far as I'm, as far as I know, is um, perhaps the language barrier, and at the same time, the different jurisdictions, you know, harmonization of the laws, the Francophone, um, Anglophone, Spanish speaking, Portuguese, you have all kinds of legal legal issues still to be resolved at, at that level. So I, I, that's, that for me is, um, is, is going to be a, is an issue that I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at how it's going to be solved um, on a holistic level. Um, beyond that, we also have a duplication of um, products across the African markets. Remember that most African economies are still primary in terms of their output, primary production, agriculture, mining, whereas um, you expect everyone to trade with one another. This is happening across the digitalization space across e on e-commerce levels. But as far as um, physical trade is concerned, I think we still have a lot to, a lot, a lot to, a lot to see a lot to go through. We, we can't, of course, rule out the issue of COVID. Um, then you have players like Nigeria who are dictating the pace at which they want to. I remember some time ago, Nigeria shut down its borders against its neighbors. Now these issues, while the legal framework it may, may look good on paper, these issues are, I think that we need to contend with. So um, that's the much I can say as far as that is concerned. I hope that's that's all that helps a, a few uh, some idea. I mean that those a few ideas have helped the discussion. Thank you. Well thank you so much Ni. Uh, that was quite a lot you shared there. Sorry that we have to call call on you impromptu but uh, it's really appreciated. So I'm sure we've taken a lot today. Uh, lots of information uh, was shared across um, you know what's happening at the moment and i'm sure that many of us are really uh, enlightened about present situation in terms of uh what's happening across africa especially with uh, the african um continental free trade uh, zone agreement 
And in that regard, uh, I'm sure we, we've, many people have left their details on the chat, just join the LinkedIn groups. And there's some very vital information also, links to pictures, links to some statistics that could also help us understand uh, uh, the, the, the situation at the moment. Uh, I'm sure you've been able to take away today um, present situation around uh, what, what, what's, what inflow to Ghana rates in terms of trade and investment. Uh, and, and I think that my expectation will be that in the new year, there's really going to be a, a kind of increase, especially when we look at the trade statistics uh, in terms of UK and, and, and Ghana. And I'm, and I'm very proud of what uh, the Global Chamber is doing uh, at the moment, really trying to create that element in terms of actually creating an environment where we have a balance between uh, the trade in the UK as well as uh, in Ghana. And for us as Synergy Systems Consults UK Limited, we're very happy, excited uh, to be working with them. Uh, Ruby and Katie have done very fabulous jobs today. I must say thank you. And uh, also thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all the participants who's been all over the world from Turkey to the US to South Africa to Tokyo, name it, so many. I can't start calling everywhere. And, and I just think uh, this is fabulous. And at this point, um, again, if you have any questions, you could reach me or Ruby or Katie. And uh, we'll be happy to take uh, questions further. And we will also be happy to provide uh, some support uh, in terms of uh, really getting businesses. Uh, partnerships and, and, and trade uh, relationships uh, between the UK and, and Ghana. And I saw a question, somebody put something there, I'm sure nobody picked it, but I think I saw it. Uh, I think there was a bit of a worry in that question to say that it looks like other countries are not being reflected uh, in terms of what is happening around AFTA, especially Nigeria. And I just thought I should mention it. Uh, but you know, this series will, will keep coming. Uh, we've done Ghana today, we'll be picking on other countries uh, in, in a few months, Nigeria, and what's happening in other parts of, 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 uh, of Africa. We'll keep picking on the, on the countries and give that profiling in terms of what is happening. So it's quite really important. I'm going to hand back to Katie, who's going to get the bus uh, to, is that, is that call going to go through? Are we, are we getting a, a call from, from the big man? <laughs> yeah. Sure okay. so, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass you back to Katie and Katie will do the finishing and, and then and that will be the end. Well, thank you very much, Patricia. And I just wanted to say a big shout out for you for pulling this together. Ruby and Patricia and I have been uh, liaising with each other for weeks and weeks to bring this together. And I must say it was very insightful, very informative. And you know what? It is just the beginning. And so what I would encourage all of you to do is to connect with one another, learn about each other, start forming those really valuable partnerships and relationships. Let's make it happen. We are the global chamber. We are here to support you. We get you and we know what the challenges are. So make sure you connect in with us because we can help you. So on that note, I'd like to say a warm thank you to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you very much. Back to you, Patricia. Okay, so at this point, I say thank you so much. Please reach out to us, reach out to me. Jewel Bano, I really wanna have a word with you. So I would like to have your email address, phone number, so you must reach me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, just, I was actually just, hoping if uh, yeah. Doug can just close us with um, his remarks. Doug, are you there? Oh, oh I, didn't, I didn't know if Doug was there. I asked after that though. Me okay, Doug. <laughs> oh, Doug, so sorry. I'm I'm so sorry. I think I missed that. I'm really, really sorry. I'm so oh, sorry no. about that. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't <laughs> sure whether you were there. Okay, so we'll hand back to Doug, who's just gonna do a uh, closing remarks and that will be today. I There's nothing to be sorry about. The conversation has <laughs> been really exciting, educational, inspiring. You know, it's it's so amazing to be at this point. I think you said January 1st of 2020 was when AFCFTA came into being. And to see the jockeying and the countries take their steps, Nigeria going a little bit slower and doing some consternation, but yet 
there's progress. And for you young people to be part of this, when you think about the next 10, 20, 30 years, what an exciting time to be alive. Probably the best time ever. Uh, probably not, probably, definitely the best time ever to be alive uh, in Africa because of so many opportunities to create wealth, but also to create a mega region that will rival other mega regions around the world. I, I certainly hope to be part of Global Chamber in the next 30 years and to look back at this period of time to say, wow, look what you've accomplished. Look what change has happened. I've had 35 years in international business and I can look back 35 years and say, wow, the, cha the world has changed, but I expect so much more in the next 30. So thank you so much for the educational information. Thank you for taking this first step within this group right here. Let's keep the opportunities flowing and, and be successful. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words at the end. Back to you, Patricia. Thank you for oh, your excellent okay. moderation. You are awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. That's really good. I, I, I say thank you too. So thank you so much for, for that, really. And uh, on this note, uh, we don't want to go. I don't want to go, but we have to go. Um, I say thank you to everyone. Please, you know, one of the things when we have sessions like this, people just try to before you know it after one week or something people forget i want to advise and i really want to encourage us take time to reach out reach out to us reach out to the connects people you've heard and just maximize those opportunities they really have a way of you know uh, opening new doors and on this point uh we we, we want to close and we say thank you for joining us today and we are open uh, to take, um, give you all the support that you need and the uh, expertise that you need in terms of, uh, of, of, of getting businesses through. So again, thank you. And we'll see you again in our next series. I'm sure maybe we have to do Nigeria then. We have to look at Nigeria. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. We have to do that. Thank you so much, Nigeria. ladies. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great teamwork. Cheers. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Ruby. All the best, Thank everyone. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Yeah.